Hello, class. We're going to discuss data collection, which is in the market research process, starting with the problem or research question to the uh, research approach to the research design, which we did last week with the surveys, and then the focus groups before that. Now, how do we collect the data? That's the key. So I'm going to be sharing some best practices with you, what I've used in the past, what works and what doesn't. And um, all this keeping in mind that this is not a scientific approach that we're going to use for our projects. Um, it's going to be more of a, um, of a, of a just an academic type approach. What I really want from you is that you understand how this process works. So if you have the opportunity to apply this scientifically to a, 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 a true random sample reflecting your target audience in the future, you'd be able to do that. So let's get into this now, data collection step four of the process. And, and the last thing I wanna say is make sure you've taken the surveys that were posted in last week's forum, in the week four forum, because um, we need to get data back from the or from Google Forms. So please do that when you can. Um, so when we are selecting, if we were going to scientifically select uh, a random sample from an overall population, we would be looking at the population here, this, 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 the big circle represents the population, but we would need, need to take a sample that is truly representative of that population. Uh, you notice that one person was taken out of each group that's in this large population. Now, that's easier said than done. Um, if you're going to uh, select a, a group that or a, a sample that represents a population, you're going to have to work at it. There needs to be a random sample of a overall population. You can't just stand it in at UC Irvine and or, or UC Riverside and stand at University Village and survey people as they walk by because you're not going to get a true representation of the overall population. What you really need is to is to go into areas uh, that represent uh, pockets and try to get a random sample. And that's going to be critical to using this tool, which is called the sample size calculator, which I'm going to pull up right now. And I want you guys to use this just from a research position. I'd like you to use this. So what we have here, this is from SurveyMonkey, and it's a it's a free tool. And let's say let's say we were going to um, survey um, Riverside, California, for example. And I'm not going to look up the population of Riverside, but for now, I'm just going to, for the purposes of discussion, I'm going to say the the population is 300,000. Okay. Now, how confident do we need to be in our results? Uh, the, you don't have to be 100% confident. You want the research you conduct is not going to be foolproof. It's not going to be perfect. How exact do you need to be? Um, and you know, a lot of a lot of users say they need to be, you know, 95% um, uh, uh, confident. And so I'm going to select 95%. It's just, it's a kind of a base of where you need to be at 95%. You don't have to be that confident always. And what's the margin for error? The margin for error has to do with, and by the way, you have to click in and enter qualities and all these. You can't just accept the number it's giving you here. You have to click into it. And, and we're going to click into it, and we're going to say a 5% margin for error. So what this number then tells us that out of 300,000 people, if we did a good job of random sampling, and we would be somewhat act, pretty accurate, 95% confidence level, 5% margin for error, 
we could we 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 would want to survey in a random sampling 384. Okay, that's um that's fair. Um, that we could do that. I think it might be kind of expensive, but we can do it. But what if you didn't have to be that accurate? What if you could be 90% have a 90% confidence level instead of 95%? The number goes down. What if your margin of error, you could open it up to 10%. You could go as low on this in this process of 69. I wouldn't go below 10% margin for error or 90% confidence level. If you go below that, it's not, this isn't going to do you very much good. The process won't. So it just goes to show you that you can, you can, uh, you know, survey as, as, as few as 69 people, you know, if, but your, your results are not going to be as accurate as they possibly could be, but you may not have to be that accurate. You're just trying to get opinions and ideas out there and you don't have to be hundred percent accurate. What if just for, for conversation sake, what if we went to 90, 90, 99% um, uh, confident level and 1% margin for error. I don't think you ever need to be this accurate, but you'd have to survey 15,000 people plus, which would be pretty darn expensive. So random sampling is not an exact science, but it, there is science behind it. So, um, you know, it depends what you want to do with it. So I'm going to ask you to use this tool and identify, you can, you can Google search your, your audience, your target area, you can Google search it and you'll give you a, a population number. Then you need to click in and change these and do the best you can with it. And then I'd like you to screenshot this right here and put it into your presentation. So that's the sample size calculator. Now, data collection, it's, it's defined that, you know, a sample of respondents that's what we're looking for here. There are different methods to do this. Um, I'm going to tell you what has worked best for me in the past and what most experts agree on. And um, as far as what you're going to be doing now, you're not going to probably be doing this in this for your project. You're probably just going to be sharing your survey with people in the class and perhaps friends and associates just to get some data back to you. That's fine. In the for the purpose of this, um, this is we don't have the resources or the time to do a random true random sample. But I needed all I really wanted was to show you how it works. So there's various mediums that collect feedback and opinion, and and, and again, it's step four of the process: data collection. You know, there's online surveys, telephone surveys, face to face. Um, and the, what we're going to be looking at are the pros and cons of each one in this short lecture. This is an image that shows them technology does affect the process. Online surveys are here. This is the data collection opportunities or choices we have. Face-to-face -face is here. Telephone surveys is here. Paper surveys is there. Paper surveys go to face-to-face -to -face sometimes. And I'll explain how that works. Sometimes this and these two are combined. Um, and I'm going to show you the pros and cons of, of each one. So first of all, let's look at online surveys. Online surveys are have key advantages over other forms of data collection. One of the real key advantages is that it's really cost effective. It doesn't cost very much to send an email. Once you have an audience that you've uh, I, uh, a sample that you've identified through email, they may be current customers. They may be um, you know people that have opted in to allow you to contact them. You can use their emails and send them a survey. As we established last week. You know, the shorter the survey, the better results are going to results are going to be. You need to really keep that in mind. Um, you know, hotels use this. Um, I get these 
from my car dealerships. They send me these, these surveys, um, surveys. However, the disadvantage, and this is becoming more of a disadvantage, are active spam filters for email. They will screen out a lot of what we're trying to do as far as the survey work. So that can be a disadvantage. And just so, again, very cost effective, but spam filters, it's hard to get through to people, harder to get through to people. Then we go to another method called, it's called, it's face-to-face. -face. It's the, the old school way. You know, you go into the marketplace, you talk to people. Um, and um, you, um, it's, it is, I can tell you from firsthand experience, the best method in a lot of cases, because, because it's really, really, uh, you, you can, when you're in front of a, of a, of a person one-on-one, -on -one, you know, a sample, you know, someone in your sample group one-on-one, -on -one, you are, you're talking to them, they're looking you in the eye, you can get around any, um, much easier, you get around uh, um, objections easier if they ask, you know, where is the survey coming from, why you take, why are we doing this, you can explain things better, and you're going to get more reliable data because of that. However, there is one drawback to it, and that is the disadvantage is high labor costs. Now, if it's your company that you're starting out of your garage and you want to do research to see if the idea is viable, you're the labor. So, um, you know, that's not a big issue with you. But if you're working for a, a larger company, going out in the marketplace is expensive. Um, researchers, professional researchers make a lot of money in doing this because it is hard, dirty, messy work. People not wanting to talk to you sometimes and that kind of thing. So, it's uh, sort of the dirty work of the business, but it pays well. So again, advantage, uh, more effective than other mediums, disadvantage, higher labor costs. Now we get to phone, phone surveys. Phone surveys were in favor, um, you know, 10 years ago, probably. And before that, of course. They're less expensive than face-to-face surveys, contacting people by phone is quicker, easier. You don't have to be in the street doing it. However, the disadvantage is becoming more apparent every almost every day. And that is more and more people have, have ditched their landlines, you know, their traditional landline phones. They've ditched them and they... Um, are not um because because they're not being used uh they're they're gone you can't call them anymore unless you're talking about old ladies who still have their phones we most of us got, have gone to cell phones and if you, if you if you do access cell phone numbers the chances are you're not then no one's going to answer the phone because they um they don't answer you guys don't answer numbers you don't know right i don't typically so that's putting this more and more to disadvantage. So bottom line is what, what was once a key way of, of surveying has really lost favor. Now, when we look at paper, this is where, you know, face-to-face -face and paper surveys sometimes go hand in hand. Um, sometimes you're in areas that don't have, uh, you know, you're connected with Google Forms or SurveyMonkey. Sometimes you're in areas that don't, have internet very well, and you need to survey people. Um, so you'd use paper. You're face-to-face you're -face with them, and you um, hand them the survey, and they you ask them to fill it out with you standing there. That can be effective. Um, on but Usually on face-to-face, -face, what I recommend is like a, like a tablet type machine or something that the respondents, you can hand them the tablet, they can click on and they can click on the um, answers. And then when they're done, they will, um, they will go ahead and uh, hand you the tablet back. Now you have the data saved and it's gone to the software that is behind Google Forms or SurveyMonkey, whatever you're using. 
and it's ready to tabulate, ready to spit out information, charts and graphs and things. If you have paper, again, it's it's more portable, easy to use sometimes, but you have an extra step now. You have to go back to your office and take the paper and hand enter the surveys that you collected, hand enter them into the, the, um, the Google Forms uh, survey and to able to, in it for, to be able to get the, the data back accurately. So that's the problem. It's the tabulation. It's slow to, to, it's slow to um, tabulate because you have to enter the data by hand. And so that's a disadvantage, but it had, does offer some advantages. I recommend face the, so let's look at the next slide. Oh, I'm going to go back. The, the, um, I recommend face-to-face, -face, even though labor costs are higher, have, have the survey on an electronic tablet and have paper surveys with you as a resource if you need to use them. So that's my recommendation on most, uh, with most uh, data, data um, finding data. And then um, what, you know, so when you get your data back, um, this was, this was a survey we we created for Amtrak for consumer survey, and we got some pretty good information back. You notice I'm using the same tools that the same survey format questions that you guys I asked you guys to use linear scale, um, you know, a uh, uh, checkbox, click more than one, a lot of linear scales here, um, multiple choice. So I used, we used all of them, another multiple choice here. But the real key is on the responses, you know, you, you get the tabulation that you want. This is the, this is why you need to take those surveys, those paper surveys and, and up and hand, hand put them into the system here because you get the nice charts and graphs. And this is something that tells a story to a client. You need to show this. So um, this is, why I wanted everyone to take everybody's surveys in the class. So you get some data back that looks something like this. I mean, you won't have 70 responses like we had here or 78 responses, but you will have, you know, 10, 20, maybe when you've taken outside your friends and associates and other people, you might get more respondents. Now you have more data to, to even though it's not scientifically collected, you have more data to find and use. So uh, what we did here was we broke down, we asked them if they wanted to be part of a focus group to leave their uh, to leave their email address. And then what we did was we'd look at to see how qualified uh, each survey was individually. We took each individual survey and we would look at how they answered it. And if they answered it the, in a way that showed knowledge and understanding of the process of the train industry, we would go ahead and perhaps use them for a focus group. So that's how that worked. And now for the project. I need you to select, as we just went over, I need you to select your data collection strategy of what I showed you and why you chose it. This is not, you're not writing up a paragraph here. You're just taking the, what you just saw in the presentation and making a recommendation, okay? And then I'd like you to apply the, the sample size calculator and come up with a number there. That's another slide in your presentation. And so you're looking at just a couple slides here for your, present, for your final presentation. The data collection slide, what you chose and why, and then the... Um, Let's apply the sample size calculator and uh, come up with numbers there and, and take a screenshot of that. And please make sure to take the surveys and share your survey with friends and people like that. So um, with that being said, I think we that's it for the week. And um, I will see you in class uh, next week.